Hi everyone, I'm Joe's Mary from GenScript. Today for our expert interview, we will be interviewing Dr. Venegala Rao. Uh, and he, he will be talking to us about uh, bacteria HT4 and its biomedical applications. So hi, Dr. Rao, thank you so much for meeting with me today. So can you please tell us more about yourself and your research interests? Well, I'm a uh, faculty member. I'm a professor of biology at the Catholic University of America. Uh, I've been here in this department uh, for, this is actually my 32nd year. Um, so uh, before that, I was in University of Maryland Medical School uh, doing postdoctoral research uh, between 80 to 89. Uh, so that's where I was introduced to bacteriophage T4. So in essence, I've been working on bacteriophage T4 for 41 years um, and um, mostly studying the basic mechanisms of the systems, uh, how genome gets packaged inside the capsid, what are the components, missionaries involved in, in packaging, uh, a little bit on uh, infection mechanism as well. Um, but then we have also, along the way, became interested in uh, how to uh, translate some of the basic knowledge to biomedical applications. And about 20 years ago, we began exploring that part of our uh, program um, translational uh, research and uh, biomedical applications. So since then we have been, I think, uh, well integrated both basic research and uh, uh, translational research. They kind of go hand in hand, each kind of feed into uh, the other. Um, most of the projects are, um, you know, there's no, you know, distinction between basic and, and uh, apple applied, uh, they kind of work well integrated and work together. So yes, uh, that's uh, in in brief uh, what we are doing now, um, generating a lot of structural genetic biochemical information, and also applying it to vaccines and other uh, biomedical applications. So can you tell us more about uh, how bacteriophage T4 has been used for vaccine development? Uh, sure. Um, T4 has two uh, non-essential capsid proteins that are exposed on the capsid surface. They are called HOC and SOC. HOC is, uh, uh, is, a, is an acronym for... <laughs> Protein. So for small autocapsid protein, there are 155 copies of HOC. Um, they are they're kind of um, inserted into the center of hexamers of the major capsid protein. Whereas uh, SOC uh, is uh, a small protein, it is uh, uh, 870 copies of this molecule. Um, that is between two capsid proteins. In a way, it is kind of clamping two adjacent uh, capsid molecules um, that form the hexamers. So, the so there are 830 copies of this. Um, SOC stabilizes the capsid uh, because it clamps the hexamers. Uh, sometimes it's also referred to as a glue protein or a cementing protein. Uh, to reinforce the capsid structure because the DNA is packaged very tightly and uh, in considerable internal pressure. Uh, so this provides extra support, especially in the external, envi external environment where uh, there might be uh, chemicals and other uh, environmental conditions that could disrupt the capsid structure. So T4 is actually very stable. You can um, put it in pH 11, 12, it's perfectly fine. It doesn't fall apart, partly because of the SOC molecule reinforcing the, uh, it actually forms a cage around the capsule. Uh, Hawk, on the other hand, it's a fiber. There are like 150 fiber eman fibers emanating from the capsule. Uh, it's probably mostly used for um, 
uh, finding a, an appropriate host, perhaps. Uh, it also has some um, uh, interaction, non-specific interactions to mammalian cells. Um, so these are non-essential proteins. So what that means is that in the, in the laboratory, we don't need these proteins. T4 phages, you can delete these proteins and T4 phage is perfectly fine. It doesn't affect assembly, doesn't affect um, infectivity. Uh, it really has no significant uh, difference that can uh, measure. So what that means is that we can now use these molecules as, as adapters to display foreign um, molecules, peptides, uh, domains, proteins uh, that will have therapeutic value, for instance, vaccines. Since they are exposed on the surface very uh, efficiently when they are presented to the immune, human immune system, uh, the immune system uh, can, can recognize these as foreign material belonging to a virus because they are symmetrically arranged on the capsule surface and can trigger immune responses and um, thereby conferring protections uh, against uh, infectious agents, pathogens, and so forth. So it's a platform technology because um, we can uh, generate these chimeras um, against any pathogen um, that we are interested in. In the past, we worked on uh, biodefense pathogens because we were funded by NIH to develop a biodefense vaccine. And in fact, uh, 2018, after about 15 plus years of work led to the development of a, a dual vaccine that can protect against both anthrax and plague. In fact, you can uh, immunize uh, or vaccinate animals with this, uh, with this vaccine and can double challenge in the sense you can challenge with both plague and anthrax and still the animals are protected against this, uh, uh, these deadly agents. So uh, it's been uh, uh, very uh, useful uh, for vaccine development. The other aspect of the our uh, biomedical application is uh, for gene therapy uh, because T4 is a large capsid and it can accommodate about 170 uh, KB of uh, uh, its own genome. So that means there is a lot of space inside the capsid. So we could potentially not potentially, now it is actually really, we could be published paper somewhere else, we can incorporate foreign genetic material uh, into the capsid and use these capsid nanoparticles as delivery vehicles to deliver good genes into defective human cells and, and such. Uh, these are at the experimental stage, mostly uh, in, in uh, culture cells and so forth. But uh, we have developed uh, a variety of options uh, using cultured cells as models to uh, use T4 as a delivery vehicle for uh, genes as well as gene protein complexes. Uh, because there's room both inside and outside, we can readily manipulate the system to uh, deliver combinations of payloads um, that could eventually could really have a great uh, uh, benefit uh, that is not currently possible with the, any other vector system. So for this vaccine development, what gene editing tools are you using for the DNA packaging? Uh, we, we have reported uh, at least uh, um, uh, uh, several model genes using initially to use model genes such as clean uh, frozen protein gene, cherry gene, and, and, and combinations and so forth. Uh, we have not published uh, this work yet, but we have um, also um, been working on therapeutic genes um, because we need to first develop the technology and put it on a very solid ground before we can um, use it for real delivery of uh, therapeutic genes. We want to make sure that the technology is mature enough and we could actually go for specific disease genes. 
um, and, and a lot of our emphasis in the last uh, about 10 years has been, has been to really develop a uh, robust technology. And if you have a good foundation uh, on the technology side, then all you have to do is replace that with a therapeutic component and, and use that robustness for application. So our emphasis has been to really not to jump prematurely into therapeutic genes and try to um, develop in vivo models, but more to develop the technology and make it very, very robust um, in, in many different ways. And, uh, and then uh, it would become uh, very logical and also very effective to incorporate therapeutic genes. But um, we have begun working on sickle cell gene. Uh, we are also working on muscular dystrophy gene, uh, dystrophin. Uh, dystrophin is particularly uh, important from the technological point of view because it's a large gene. Uh, there is currently no vector system, I mean, no good vector system like AAV or lentivirus, for example, extensively used for gene therapy. They don't have enough room to accommodate muscular dystrophy gene. Um, but T4 has plenty of room for that. Uh, so that's one good reason. Also, it's a clearly a very important uh, disease that uh, we, we need to provide some, um, uh, some therapeutic uh, options. So we, we have begun, we have just begun. I think the technology has really matured. Uh, we published a couple of papers on that. 2013, one paper, and 2018, uh, I think 19 probably, actually, maybe 18, 2018, one paper. And the one is currently under review. These are all technology papers. Um, uh, but uh, now we just have begun the uh, using these you know, disease genes for uh, potential future therapies. And where do you see the future of medical applications for bacteria FHT4? As you mentioned, um, a, this might have uh, the potential for a delivery system for gene editing for sickle cell uh, and other chronic diseases as well. Yeah, yeah. first let me briefly mention or uh, talk about the um, editing issue. Um, along the way, we figured that it's really important to um, uh, another another part of this technological push is to be able to um, engineer the T4 genome uh, very efficiently. Uh, phages clearly are much. Uh, more amenable for engineering, yet there are still blocks, roadblocks in that. Um, classical genetics are still very tedious. They're fast, much faster than other organisms, but still they're tedious. So we published a paper 2017, another one 2018, and last year, third another paper and a couple more papers are now uh, in process, one under review and one in, in uh, uh, preparation. So all these studies are really uh, develop parallel technology uh, to engineer the phage genome uh, so that we can create these recombinant phages very fast. Uh, classical genetics are very tedious, laborious, time-consuming, and so forth. So that's uh, the reason why we applied the CRISPR genome editing to phage engineering. In fact, phage is engineering its genome using CRISPR uh, for millennia. In fact, the whole CRISPR technology, I mean, CRISPR's concept is, uh, is, a, is a reflection of the relationship between the host bacteria and the phages that invade them. So they have evolved, co-evolved. Um, yet, the, the CRISPR has been extensively used for mammalian human genome manipulation, but barely touched for phage genome manipulation. So that's kind of ironic because 
uh, that would have been a logical uh, thing to do. But in terms of biomedical applications, phages are, are not usually considered for biomedical application. They are great biotechnology tools, but not biomedical therapeutic uh, agents. So our approach is very different. We uh, consider phages have great biomedical value uh, because we we know phages, we know the molecular mechanisms, we know the assembly structures very deeply. So we have a lot more ability to manipulate the phages and then re-engineer them appropriately for biomedical applications. In order to do that, you have to have a very efficient uh, process to engineer the phage genome. Um, and CRISPR is the, probably the best way, at, le- at the moment, that's the best way to, uh, to do. We tried all the other classical ways. And um, so, yeah, we basically could engineer the phage backbone at will, so to speak. Um, and if we want to construct vaccines, we would incorporate certain elements uh, into phage to make it as a um, as a vaccine. Uh, and and we have and work on the COVID vaccine, and we have a vaccine that is actually moving towards phase one clinical trial. Actually, phase two for based vaccine. But if we want to use it for gene therapeutics, we would engineer it in a different way. Um, and uh, and then the questions are different in the sense, how do we make the phages um, um, uh, acceptable for entry into human cells? Uh, what kind of elements you want to incorporate. Not only the DNA that is packaged, the payload is very clear. We know what you want to deliver. And, and we know we have the probably the best technology for any vector uh, at the moment, I think. Um, we can do some very sophisticated deliveries uh, or incorporate the payloads into T4. But how do you um, uh, have these payloads cross the barriers uh, of human cell uh, envelopes, uh, cell membrane, and um, intracellular trafficking and reach the appropriate destinations. So those are some of the barriers that we have to uh, now um, uh, break through. And, uh, and that's what we are working on, how we can actually incorporate, engineer the viruses so that they can break through these barriers. Then you will have the best of the both worlds where you can have an efficient entry and of course, fantastic uh, ability to deliver the payloads. So obviously we are not there yet, but these are some of the things that um, I think uh, are doable. Um, uh, So that's our emphasis. uh, Well, thank you so much for meeting with us today, uh, Dr. Rao. On behalf of Transcript, we appreciate you taking the time to speak with us and stay tuned for our next expert interview.